Welcome to our webinar. Uh, I'm Jack Barth. I'm the Executive Director of the Marine Studies Initiative. And today we're going to lead you through some amazing facts and discussion about the future of food from the sea. From this opening uh, photo, you can see some wild caught Pacific Ocean perch there. We'll talk a little bit about wild caught fisheries as well as aquaculture and a whole range of uh, issues. So normally this time of year, the Marine Studies Initiative hosts an open house on campus, but since we're unable to do that, I just thought I'd share a few things about the initiative. So it's uh, university and statewide, and it's really pulling together all of our efforts in the marine realm to ensure this healthy future for our ocean and the planet. And we stress transdisciplinary research. So that means that many uh, disciplines and experts come together, not only to solve the problem, but to define the approach. And I think what you're gonna see in Food from the Sea is that we definitely need a lot of different expertises. Uh, in that middle bubble, you see the Marine Studies undergraduate degree. We're very proud of that. That just got approved and is open now for all incoming students or transfer students at Oregon State University. It's a very inclusive degree. Anybody with an interest in um, helping out the ocean and coasts can come in, whether it's uh, social science, economics, policy, uh, arts and humanities, as well as our natural sciences. And you'll see a, a glimpse of each of those today. And then far on the right-hand side, the Ocean 11 Student Marine Club. That's our new club university-wide, and the 11 is for the 11 colleges from Oregon State University. And we do have members from every single college. You'll meet two of them in just a minute. So really this is about advancing excellence across marine related education, research and outreach and engagement. So the program, we've got my welcome remarks and then we'll do a short program. And I'd just like to briefly introduce uh, our panelists. So first up, Scott Appel, he's an associate professor Department of Fisheries and Wildlife at OSU. Welcome, Scott. And then we're really lucky to have Andrew Plintinga join us today. He's uh, based, he's a professor down at the Bren School of Environmental Science and Management at the University of California, Santa Barbara. So welcome, Andrew. Glad to be here. And then next up, Christina DeWitt, who has the most titles of all of us, but uh, not only Interim Director of the Coastal Oregon Marine Experiment Station and Professor of Food Science and Technology, but she's going to share with us in her role as Director of the OSU Seafood Lab in Astoria. Welcome, Christina. Yeah, glad to be here. And our last panelist will be Matt Hockyard. He's a research associate out in uh, the Coastal Oregon Marine Experiment Station in Newport. Welcome, Matt. Thanks, Jack. The, uh, the role of summing up and uh, kind of reflecting where o OSU is on each of these food from the sea ideas is Gil Sylvia. He's a marine resource economist and professor emeritus in applied economics at OSU. Welcome, Gil. Thanks, Jack. So we'll go through those brief presentations and open it up for Q&A. And that'll be, we're really lucky to have that facilitated by two Ocean 11 students uh, they're both uh, biology majors with their interests in marine biology. Uh, Drew Taylor is a senior joining us. Hi, Drew. Thanks for having me. And then Jenna Cordisco is a, a junior. Welcome, Jenna. Thank you for having me as well. Great. So let's uh, stay on time and we'll go right into the presentation. So I'd like to kick it off with the next slide, introducing Scott Hapel. Great, thank you, Jack. And thanks to you and Virginia and the Marine Studies Initiative for organizing this, for Jenna and Drew for joining us to facilitate us and our other panel members. And welcome to everybody that's here to, to listen and ask questions today. My intent today for my part is to talk to you about food from the sea as it is now talk a little bit about seafood trends as well as harvest levels at the global, national, and local level, and then some issues that we're considering now that will lead into Andrew's talk about what might happen in the future. 
First of all, it's important to eat, emphasize that we eat a lot of seafood. Uh, annual consumption, as estimated by the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization, is about 20 kilograms per person. As you can see on the graph on the right, that has been increasing over time. It has, in fact, more than doubled since the 1950s. Of course, that's an average. Consumption can be as high as 98 kilograms per person in some countries, and because of that, it means that seafood accounts for around 17% of global protein intake and meets up to 70% for coastal and island areas. And that's really important to remember is that seafood, while not necessarily a major emphasis uh, in the United States, is a critical resource for some places and some peoples. And in fact, the fish protein makes up somewhere on the order of a one-fifth of all the total dietary protein taken up uh, by 3.1 billion people on this planet. Of course, to deal with that, we have to catch and grow a lot of seafood. This is United Nations data showing the capture fisheries and aquaculture over time going back to the 1950s. A couple things to notice here is that starting in the sort of the mid early to mid 1980s, uh, wild capture fisheries have effectively plateaued. We are not harvesting more and more out of the oceans, uh, at least not much. And where we've seen a lot of growth has been in aquaculture, which is something that, that Matt is going to address and particularly uh, recently increases uh, in some marine aquaculture and marine waters. Commercial fishing is really important in the US, obviously, particularly to coastal, coastal areas. Total landings, and these are data from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, total landings in 2018 were somewhere on the order of 9.4 billion pounds of seafood, valid at about $5.6 billion. Our really high value species tend to be those things that we consider delicacies, mostly crustaceans and mollusks, lobsters and crabs and scallops and shrimp, but you'll notice that salmon is on that list on the left as well. And all regions, all coastal regions of the country really rely heavily on seafood. Uh, here on the West Coast, we catch about 12% of the total landings and 13% of the value nationwide. Of course, Alaska is the heavy hitter, 58% uh, of landings and 32% of the value. But there's also substantial uh, uh, both earnings and landings coming in from the Gulf Coast and Eastern Seaboard. Dutch Harbor. Home of deadliest catch and whatnot is where we see the highest volume. Uh, we've been doing that for 22 years, in large part because the largest uh, food fish fishery in the world, the Alaska Pollock fishery, is largely based out of Dutch. But you'll also notice on this panel on the right, down on the lower left, that Astoria is in the top 10 for landing. So right here in little old Oregon, Astoria and all of our ports are really important. So that's what's going on at this national level, but what does fishing really mean to uh, the Oregon and the Oregon coast. Well, the Oregon commercial fishery in 2018, $151 million. It doesn't really contribute a lot to Oregon's overall gross domestic product. But if you look at the population on the Oregon coast, and if you're to sum up the numbers, people live in all 25 largest cities, it's about 117,000 people. And so while it might not be really important to Oregon as a whole, it is super important for both employment and economic revenue in our coastal communities. We have about 1,000 fishing vessels, 1,300 commercial fishers, 1,100 processing, those that handle the fish once it's been landed. And it generates, they estimate, around $544 million a year for the coastal community. And the other thing to notice is that those are above median income pay, so they are high value jobs for the coast. Uh, you can see on the right there the distribution that Lincoln and Clatsop County, Curry County and Coos are where we see most of our fishing jobs. To look at 2019, so data from last year, crab, that crustacean is our big money, $68 million, ground fish, $28 million, whiting, $22, but pink shrimp, albacore and salmon all play a role. And on the right here, we can see that generally value, the revenue being earned, is going up over time, although in the late 80s and early 90s, there was a substantial drop in the number of active fishing vessels, in large part because of changes to the salmon fishery uh, back in those decades, and it's held relatively steady since then. Things aren't all great necessarily, and it is important to acknowledge that. The number of unsustainable fisheries globally, and these are your United Nations FAO data, is increasing, and the number of under a harvested fish is decreasing. So globally, there are some trends that are concerned, although a large block of this are still uh, assumed to be and managed as sustainable fisheries. A similar story has played out here in Oregon. 
Uh, for those of you that were around and paying attention to fisheries back in the late 90s and early 2000s, there was a lot of concern, particularly for our ground fish stocks and big declines in numbers over time. This is for seven different species that were ultimately legally declared overfished. And that led to the actual declaration of a federal fisheries disaster akin to a disaster for any other natural disaster, you know, earthquakes, um, hurricanes and so on and so forth that freed up federal resources to deal with the fact that the fisheries had declined. They've been declining for decades. There was lots of pressures through the Magnuson-Stevens Fisheries Conservation and Management Act, our national uh, fishery law. And that in 2000, this federal disaster was declared. There was uh, millions of dollars made available in disaster relief to retrain people, to buy vessels back out of the fishery, to reduce the capitalization in the fishery. There were job losses, there were economic impacts, and most importantly, for the long-term perspective, there were a lot of rebuilding plans that were put into place by the Pacific Fishery Management Council to recover those overfished stocks and move us towards a much more sustainable future. There was a write-up by Sean Conway, I believe, in, uh, a few years ago. Can't remember the exact date uh, if you want to read more about that, but the responses to the West Coast groundfish disaster. And it's important to note that those rebuilding efforts have really paid off, that the uh, struggles that the uh, coastal communities went through, that the fisheries went through, the efforts that the council went through, uh, led to the recovery of six of those seven stocks in a period of about 20 years. And in fact, the one that isn't yet recovered, yellow eye rockfish, is on that trajectory. And in fact, it was such a big story that those fisheries have gone from being declared overfished to being certified as sustainable by the Marine Stewardship Council for the West Coast trawl fishery. And it's important to note that that trend is generally showing in fisheries across the United States where as of June 2020, over the last 20 years, there have been 47 stocks declared overfished that have been rebuilt. So that's our status for now. Uh, Andrew's going to take over now and give us a little bit of a look about where we might headed, be headed in the future. Hey, uh, hello, everybody. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is um, a paper that I was a co-author on called The Future of Food from the Sea. Uh, it appeared recently in uh, Nature. So the motivation for our paper, uh, as Scott was alluding to, was that the United Nations Food and Agriculture uh, organization estimates that the world will need to produce uh, an additional 177 million metric tons of meat by uh, 2050. Meeting these future food needs from land-based sources, so traditional agriculture, uh, faces a number of challenges due to resource constraints uh, as well as environmental impacts. So what we do in the paper is to ask what role can sustainable production of food from the sea play in meeting these uh, targets. So we examine wild fisheries and farm species or uh, mariculture, which currently represent about 17% of global meat production. Uh, to answer our research question, we look at plausible future demand and supply scenarios, emphasizing the ecology of um, fisheries, uh, policies that affect the production of food from the sea, technologies, uh, as well as the preferences that humans have for, um, for seafood. So really the, the core of our analysis has to do with uh, producing demand and supply curves for uh, global fisheries. Um, to tell you what a demand curve is, first of all, it's a schedule that tells us for any given price, how much do consumers wanna buy? A supply curve is, tells you for a given price, how much, does, uh, how much will producers wanna sell? And it's where these two come together, where demand is equal to supply, that we determine how much a market will, will produce. So you can see in the uh, picture, the intersection of demand and supply defines on the horizontal axis uh, QCC, which is the quantity produced under current demand and current, current supply. So what can happen though, is that we can have changes in supply and demand. And so uh, if supply shifts out, for example, uh, because of technological change that lowers the cost of production, you can see that this will produce a different quantity. So in this 
picture, supply shifts out. QCF is now our, um, our quantity produced um, as a result. It also can happen that demand shifts out. For example, if people's income goes up and they, they wanna buy more at a given price, and when that happens, you can see that that's another way that the quantity produced can increase as well. In this case, going uh, if we have both demand and supply shifts, we go from QCC all the way out to QF. So essentially what our study is, involves is estimating current demand and current supply for global fisheries, figuring out what future demand and future supply scenarios might be, and then seeing what the implications will be for the quantity produced, just as shown in this graph. Starting with supply curves, we look at three different sectors, marine wild fisheries, which Scott referred to as capture fisheries, uh, finfish mariculture, and bivalve mariculture. We start by deriving where the current supply curves are and then look at alternative future scenarios. So for wild fisheries, we're really looking at the potential for supply increases through management reforms of the type that Scott uh, referred to. For finfish mariculture here, we're interested in looking how supply might increase through policy reforms. In other words, figuring out ways to allow more, uh, mar more mariculture in more areas as well as lower cost feed inputs, uh, as well as alternative feed inputs. So instead of, for example, feeding uh, wild fish to uh, uh, salmon, for example, which is typically how it's done today, there are ways to alternatively produce feed inputs from say um, land-based sources and, and a variety of other possibilities. For bivalve mar mariculture, we're looking again at future supply increases through policy reform. So how can we figure out to allow there to be more, um, more mariculture in more places? Turning to the demand side, here we start out by deriving the current demand. Then we look at future um, potential for uh, shifts in demand. So the current demand is the green curve you see there. Future demand takes just projected increases in population and income, figures out what the demand curve would look like in that case. That's the blue curve you see there. And then we have one, what we call extreme demand, where we take all those projected increases in population and income, but also layer on top of that preference changes. So people just wanting to eat more seafood, that gives us the red curve. When we put together those future supply and demand scenarios, we get changes in the quantity of food from the sea, uh, as I showed before. Currently, we are at about 55 million metric tons, uh, which you can see in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, 55 million metric tons, 84% or most of it coming from wild fisheries. If we then just say, okay, let's suppose that demand stays where it is, but we have all of those supply increases, that gives us the uh, graph in the upper right, that actually doesn't increase food from the sea very much. It only goes up to about 62 million metric tons uh, with still most of it coming from wild fisheries. However, if we combine the future supply increases with future demand increases, then in the lower left-hand corner, we're up to 80 million metric tons with more of it, 28% uh, uh, coming from mariculture. And finally, if we combine our future supply shifts together with extreme demand, then we get to 103 million metric tons with almost half of it coming from mariculture. This 103 million metric tons is about one third of the way to that FAO target that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. You may be wondering, well, is there a way to get all the way to the FAO target using uh, food from the sea? And the answer is there is a way to get there, but, the only, but that would involve people basically being willing to eat um, uh, pretty much anything. So right now, you know, people like to eat salmon uh, more than mussels. If people were willing to eat um, uh, bivalve, bivalves, 
uh, that would be one way of getting there, but currently that doesn't seem to be reflected in people's preferences. Uh, and with that, I'm done and I'll pass it over to Christina. Thank you, Andrew. So we are now going to transition to why seafood is an important food resource in terms of how it can directly benefit our health. Hopefully the sandwich that I have here toasted and the salmon, I know it's close to dinner time, so hopefully <laughs> People hang with us here, um, don't get too hungry. As Jack indicated, I have several titles, um, but the one that I've held the longest is as director of the OSU Seafood Research and Education Center. And many of you might not be aware that the College of Agricultural Sciences has a seafood experiment station that's actually located in Astoria, Oregon. Uh, this experiment station is the only one of its kind on the West Coast. Um, the slide kind of provides a general overview of the type of work conducted at the Seafood Center in support of our stakeholders. Uh, we collaborate not only with stakeholders through um, research projects, but we also conduct fee-for-service uh, evaluations, similar to what a third-party testing facility might do. Um, we have a pilot plant that allows us to offer our stakeholders a unique environment to test and validate new innovations. Um, on the top left corner of the slide, uh, you'll see a uh, graduate student of ours uh, pulling uh, a bioimpedance device. And it was developed by a startup, uh, Seafood Analytics. It is used for uh, measuring in real time the quality of fish and um, is uh, rapidly being adopted by the industry. Um, right now, uh, below that um, is a picture of ice uh, produced by a startup called uh, Nano Ice. Uh, the ice is very soft, feels like a gel if you put your thumb on it, it will actually leave uh, the rings on your thumb as a fingerprint on it. Um, one of the things that really makes it unique, uh, aside from the micron size or submicron size uh, ice crystals, um, is that it can be um, produced real time directly from seawater. So some of the exciting kind of innovative things and technologies that we work with. Uh, the remaining photos um, are both from classroom and hands-on workforce training efforts that we do. The streaming school is our longest running effort. We've been uh, critical in training over 7,000 uh, seafood professionals globally. Uh, one of our newest outreach activities is the Seafood Wastewater and Byproduct Utilization Conference. Uh, the conference was actually created uh, as a collaboration between industry agencies and academia to help Oregon seafood industry meet changing regulatory requirements and to provide them with state-of-the-art information on technology to better manage their processing waste discharges. Uh, the Seafood Center, however, is not only engaged with technology innovation, it's also working directly with industry and stakeholders and with our academic colleagues to better understand the health potential of our foods that are harvested from the sea. Many of us are aware that seafood is good for us. Uh, current USDA dietary guidelines recommend consuming eight ounces of seafood per week, which is equivalent to about two servings. Um, on this slide, I've provided some specific benefits from seafood listed. Uh, benefit to your heart, uh, your brain, uh, your eye, and also to muscle development. Most of us are probably aware of what um, seafood um, can do for the heart, but maybe brain, eye, and muscle development is kind of new. Most of the health benefits linked to seafood come from special long chain unsaturated fats. Uh, these special fats are called omega-3 fatty acids. A significant amount of the research are, has demonstrated uh, the benefits of consuming seafood and the role of omega-3 fatty acids have in not only preventing heart disease, but reducing stroke, obesity, and also hypertension. Even more important, important is the discovery that these fatty acids are important to the neurological development of infants and children, and also important to maintaining good neurological function in the elderly. And you can see um, kind of the chemical composition of these uh, special omega-3 fatty acids, also commonly uh, referred to as EPA and DHA. So this slide is from research showing how consumption of tuna and other fish is correlated with risk reduction for congestive heart failure. Um, you can see uh, the column for servings of fish as the amount of servings of seafood consumed increases. Uh, the hazard represented by orange boxes with, uh, on the X scale, you see 1.0, that's the highest hazard, um, actually uh, de decreases as uh, the amount of uh, seafood consumed increases. Um, researchers from this study reported that one to two servings per week uh, 
of seafood, tuna, and other fish can uh, reduce the risk of congestive heart failure in older adults by 20%, and consuming three to four servings per week uh, can reduce the risk by up to 30%. The benefits of seafood consumption can also be linked to improvements though in your immune system. So when we think about seafood, uh, typically we think about what it can do for our heart, but it can also help our immune system, which is really important uh, this time period. Uh, research has demonstrated that increased omega-3 uh, consumption uh, from seafood can reduce the symptoms of asthma and certain allergies. Uh, seafood is also an important uh, a source, of an important essential mic micronutrient from humans, uh, selenium. But selenium is a powerful antioxidant and can improve the immune system. And uh, the quote that I have there comes from the National Institute of Health or NIH. And you can see that they suggest selenium might play an important role in the prevention of cancer. But this is really kind of the tip of the iceberg, so to speak, when it comes to fully understanding the health benefits from our foods from the sea. And I wanted to use my last slide to kind of highlight some of the exciting current research being conducted by OSU Beavers in partnership with stakeholders on furthering our understanding of the health benefits uh, from seafood. Uh, you can see that we're looking at not, not only um, kind of unique co-products and uh, processing co-products that come from our processors, uh, looking at um, the health value, um, but we're also looking at the macroalgae, uh, trying to understand how bioactives uh, can be used um, to improve uh, human health. And so I'm going to transfer this on to Dr. Matt Hockier. He's, uh, as Jack said, from the Coastal Oregon Marine Experiment Station which is located on the Hatfield Marine Science Campus in Newport. And um, Dr. Hawker's specialty is aquaculture, so he's going to talk about some exciting developments in this next section on the future of food from the sea. Uh, yep, thank you. So uh, I have uh, the uh, kind of fun part of this, of uh, what I think is a lot of fun. I'm just going to introduce uh, some interesting things that are going on in aquaculture. Uh, this is by no means a comprehensive review, but just to uh, highlight some things that I think are interesting and uh, food for thought. So first I wanted to start with just a local example of uh, what's going on in our area. So oyster and bivalve shellfish aquaculture is uh, by far the kind of mainstay of the Pacific Northwest aquaculture industry. Um, what's really neat about bivalve shellfish aquaculture, particularly oysters, is that they are, um, first of all, they're very low trophic level uh, species, meaning that they're eating very low on the, you know, the supposed food web. Um, and what these animals, we, you know, we plant them out as juveniles into bays and estuaries and different types of systems like bags and long lines, but they are actually uh, grazing on the uh, natural occurring phytoplankton and particulate organic matter. And what, what that results in is an ecosystem service of this uh, industry where they're actually clarifying water quality, um, in, improving, uh, you know, the um, overall water quality by removing excess uh, organic production. And that's particularly uh, an issue in places with like high nutrient loading in those systems. Um, anyways, uh, here's some examples of some, some oyster farms. Uh, so you guys get an example of what these look like. Uh, another really uh, kind of fun thing that's uh, growing really rapidly is the interest in the culture of uh, macroalgae. So uh, in our laboratory out at the Hatfield Marine Science Center, we've been growing dulse, which you may have heard of as the uh, bacon tasting seaweed uh, I, you know, I caution people, it tastes like bacon in the same, same way some wines might have notes of chocolate. Uh, so take it with a grain of salt, but it is very tasty. And on the top right, I'm showing a avocado grassalaria sandwich I made last summer. Uh, very good. The really cool thing about macroalgae is that um, it requires no fresh water that you can grow this in salt water. Uh, you don't, there, we don't really add, need any nutrient additions for growing uh, dulse and kelp can grow, grow in just natural seawater without nutrient addition. And this is all done without um, arable land. So we don't have to worry about land use. So a lot of the issues that we have with the expansion of traditional agriculture just don't apply here. And it's very nutritious. Uh, dulse is very high in protein. A lot of these algaes are uh, very high in a number of other things that have nutritional benefits for, for humans. Uh, just another kind of shifting gears to uh, more so finfish aquaculture. You know, traditionally the way we've reared uh, marine finfish is by feet catching other wild fish, turning those wild fish like menhaden and Peruvian anchovy into fish meal, and then feeding those fish in the form of pelletized feeds to things like salmon. 
Uh, the industry is really interested in getting away from that, one, because of limitations on those wild fisheries, but two, the, just the sustainability associated with this um, and economics. And so there's a lot of really interesting and uh, ideas, and, and actually there's been a lot of evolution in uh, addition, feed additives for, um, or feed ingredients used in fish diets. One of them, this is, I'm showing here this picture of uh, black soldier fly larvae. So what they're doing here is actually taking food waste, like restaurant food waste and other types of food waste, and then incubating black soldier flies in uh, particularly the larvae in that food waste and then turning those uh, larvae into fish meal, into a meal that can be used uh, to replace fish meal. And they've actually found that salmon uh, will grow at similar rates when fed diets high in fish meal, I mean, uh, insect meal when compared to just standard fish meal. Uh, just really quickly, just wanted to show that there's some evolution going on in engineering, uh, particularly offshore systems. So these, uh, these are just some examples of some offshore cages. Uh, in fact, the, um, some of these systems just float in currents. They're not even moored. They call it the Valala project because they can just float uh, with remote sensing. Um, but this is allowing us to expand away from near shore sensitive uh, areas and move out into uh, deeper water and with high flushing. And there's a variety of other benefits associated with that. Uh, recirculating aquaculture is uh, another interesting thing. This is actually removing uh, marine, particularly marine finfish culture, but it could be applied to shellfish as well. But removing it from the ecosystem and actually doing this in land-based systems, uh, there are benefits to that in that you don't impact uh, wild populations. You don't have to worry about things like escapement. Uh, there are a number of other kind of ecological benefits. Um, this is a system that's actually being built in Florida right now. Um, by Atlantic Sapphire, and they're uh, actually posing that this is going to meet a very large fraction of the North American market and a very small footprint. So just something to keep an eye on. And then this is a, a integrated multi-trophic aquaculture, which I realize is a, a mouthful, and there's some discussions of <laughs> changing that acronym, but the short of it, it's really cool. It's, it works very similar to an organic farm in that you're growing species that are complementary to one another um, in order to utilize like their waste products and such. So on the, the way this picture is oriented, there's a you know net pens of fish on the far left. Those fish are fed food. They also um, you know have ex uh, excretions that uh, the particulate excretions and uneaten food may settle to the bottom and be eaten by things uh, like sea cucumbers or sea urchins. Um, the uh, smaller particulate organic matter would float downstream and those are muscle long lines shown kind of in the center of the screen. And so the muscles would uptake that particulate matter, uh, fine particulate matter. And then the dissolved nutrients such as nitrogen waste uh, would actually go downstream and be taken up by macroalgae. And so the, the farmers one are mitigating um, any negative environmental impacts by growing these secondary crops, but also uh, finding economic benefit in them. And so last, I just wanted to highlight, you know, this is an example of uh, kind of an IMTA system um, or an integrated um, multi-trophic aquaculture where in Hawaii, they're actually growing uh, dulse, the, the uh, seaweed that we're growing in our lab and then feeding it to abalone. The abalone grow actually very well on it. It's very nutritious for them. Uh, and then the abalone um, metabolize that and excrete nitrog nitrogenous wastes and that actually helps the dulse grow. So it goes back and is recirculated in the system. The dulse grow fat, the dulse grow through the nutrient additions and, um, and they act as a biofilter, thereby maintaining better water quality for the abalone. And this is technology that was developed here at Oregon State University by uh, Chris Langdon and Dimitropoulos um, about a couple of decades ago. And um, with that, I think that's my last slide. So I just wanna say uh, thank you. And I hope I got you thinking about aquaculture in uh, some different ways. There's, it's a very uh, extensive topic. And uh, next we're gonna hear from Gil Sylvia, who's a uh, former director of the Coastal Oregon Marine Experiment Station. And he's going to uh, walk us through some of the key issues that we uh, have addressed today and get us thinking deeper about them. So there is a lot of uh, food for the sea initiatives right now going on at OSU. And so we're gonna talk about these and also what this means for the future of Food for the Sea at OSU. So when the Marine Studies Initiative was launched in about 2014, this created an opportunity for faculty to rethink our seafood, aquaculture, and fisheries programs at OSU in terms to build them out and take advantage of all the assets we have at OSU and to do this consistent with the principles of the Marine Studies Initiative. 
So a group of faculty, we band together, start having meetings and develop a white paper on food from the sea. And in that white paper, we came up with three key findings. So one that to take advantage of all these possibilities for the need for seafood for the future, and what OSU can provide, we need to take a comprehensive systems approach to seafood, um, integrating our natural ecosystem disciplines with food system disciplines in creative ways. So uh, as we think about this, I was thinking about the challenges of these, of need and why we need to take a systems approach. So we came up with some conundrums. Now, I don't have time to work through all these, but let me take the first one, because Scott Appel mentioned this. So we have biological base rules for rebuilding fish stocks in the United States and many parts of the world. And certainly they can result in sustainability certification. But in reality, they can also literally destroy local seafood infrastructure, jobs, and markets, because they're not based on broader seafood thinking. They're being based on on, on um, primarily ecological or biological thinking. And uh, there's a lot of these conundrums, I could have put up a hundred up here, which just reinforced in my mind the need to take a more comprehensive view in finding solutions to the seafood opportunities and challenges. Our second finding yet is there is no major university seafood system in the United States center. And in fact, there is no seafood center in the United States that it was, could properly be called a center. And finally, when you look at OSU and all our resources, we are, we are an amazing university. We have the Food Innovation Center. We have the Seafood Campus in Astoria. We have the HMSC. We have the Marine Experiment Station. We have the Department of Fish and Wildlife. We have CEOS. And I could go on. There are very few universities in the entire country that have this set of attributes and disciplines that cut across the entire seafood system. The problem is, though, is that these assets are widely distributed and there is no organized institutional approach. And what we argue in this paper is the need for OSU to develop an institutional approach. So rather than take these ideas to, this, this is representative how OSU operates. So rather than taking them to the university initially, we took them out to the public and to our stakeholders. So we had a workshop on food from the sea in May, 2018. Uh, we had a great, uh, committee we put together of both partners in the industry and, and, and community members as well as faculty to help uh, uh, have an exciting workshop and really dig down to discussing what it would take to put together a seafood, seafood uh, systems and innovation center. So you can see all the sponsors we had on our right who contributed financially and with ideas and a lot of other ways. And we told the participants to be bold in their thinking, embrace entrepreneurial thinking, uh, make sure that the kind of things we're thinking about would bring value to them, uh, and finally to have fun and eat a lot of seafood. So we had great delicious seafood that we ate during the three days. Um, and we developed methods to drive discussion and ideas uh, and use a lot of cool techniques. So people were very busy and very interactive. There was no time to play on your phones or your, or your pads during these three days. Uh, and, and that resulted in a lot of great ideas. So um, we did not try to reach consensus on exactly what a center would precisely try to look like, but we did come up with kind, kind of themes. For example, that a center would need to work with industry and embrace industry and community engagement. Well, well, and while it would support local needs, it would also have to address global food insecurity. It has to be designed to develop industry-ready leaders and be a bold and trusted and neutral convener. We also had meetings of faculty to look at aquaculture, which Matt just talked about. We recognized, and so we met for about a year with over 50 faculty who did a lot of, really rolled up the sleeves and did a lot of hard work on putting together another white paper with a lot of great ideas in it to how we can advance aquaculture investment at OSU and its abilities to produce value to stakeholders and to students. And we recognize that, again, just like seafood, we have a huge set of aqu unique aquaculture assets at OSU. We compare well with other West Coast states uh, and universities in terms of aquaculture, although the, where the most investment's been made in aquaculture, as you can see with this map below, is actually more on the east and south coast. 
Um, and that there has been less work in aquaculture on the West Coast at our universities. Um, and the fact that there's a lot of support right now from the federal government and industry investment, there's over a billion dollars right now being built in aquaculture in the U.S., including the slide that Matt showed um, on this on the Blue Sapphire uh, uh, project down in Florida. So um, we recommend it. We're recommending to develop a center of excellence in aquaculture. You do that in using a collaborative seafood systems approach modernize our education programs at OSU, and potentially create an aquaculture innovation center. And finally, just to note, there's a lot of other OSU sea, food for the sea initiatives going on at Oregon State. For example, we have a blue economy, discussions about a blue economy initiative that would build and focus on food from the sea concepts. Our, our College of Agriculture, which is OSU's largest college, is working on a new strategic plan uh, and one of its key focus is on food from the sea concepts and marine conservation, and there's a variety of others. So in final summary, uh, there's a lot going on at OSU. And I want to thank all the OSU faculty and staff who've worked on this over the last four years, uh, five years, as well as thank all our stakeholders, partners, industry that we've worked on. We have laid the foundation to build a new future for Food for the Sea at Oregon State University. And it's now time to have some really serious discussions on how we can do this in a creative, innovative way and pull together our assets, people assets, infrastructure assets, and take it to the next level. And I think with that, Jack, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Take it over, thanks. Thank you, Gil, that was great. And thanks to Matt and Christina, Andrew and Scott too. So I've got, all sorts of ideas in my head, and I see that there's about, you know, more than 10 questions coming in in the Q&A, so please do use that Q&A button down the bottom of your Zoom screen there. So what we're going to do is uh, look at those questions and ask them of the panelists, and I'd like to reintroduce our two wonderful students, um, Jenna and Drew, and turn it over to them to run a question and answer period. All right, well, thank you so much. Um, we're going to get started with the Q&A uh, section. We've been collecting your questions as you've been sending them in. Uh, so the first question, we actually have two. Um, this is for Scott. Uh, first, for clarification, we had a quick initial question regarding landings. Can you define landing or landings uh, for this conference? Thank you. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, good question. Uh, Simply put, it's basically the fish, once it's transferred from the boat on which it's been caught to the dock. So the landings are how we measure the fish that are captured, either in numbers more commonly in terms of weight. Thank you. And the second question we have is really, what is the current state of the world's fisheries? Should we be concerned now? And should we be concerned for the future? Yeah, that's a, that's a great, question, a bit of a loaded question. And of course, the answer as always is, is it depends, right? It depends on, on where you are in the world. It depends on not just the sort of the culture of where you are and the regulatory framework that's there, but it also depends a bit on the history of those, of those fisheries. If I'd been asked that question 20 years ago here in the U.S., I think I'd give a different answer than I would give now. Uh, here in the U.S., I would say that Generally, on average, I think that things are at right now fairly positive with the changes uh, and efforts that are being made to build towards uh, fisheries that are biologically sustainable. And I see a lot more emphasis, particularly coming out of uh, federal agencies, looking at the social and economic side of things as well. There are clearly, as we see more and more overexploited fisheries uh, appearing worldwide as based on the UN FAO, uh, analyses, there really are places for concern where either it's illegal fishing or poorly managed fishing or poorly regulated because of lack of enforcement. And you know, I say that and I think it's important to realize that what that really means is I think we need to be conscious consumers for where our food comes from, seafood included. Thank you. That was a wonderful answer. All right, I'll turn it over to Drew. Jenna? Um, our second question 
comes from Alexandra Avila, and it is for Andrew. Um, climate change is affecting our oceans and some of our fisheries more than others that we're aware of at this current moment. Um, does Costello et al. model take into consideration how climate change will affect production of seafood and our ability to meet that demand? So that's a, a great question. The short answer is no. In this study, uh, we did not look at that, though there is other work underway by some of the some of the co-authors on on the paper, in particular um, Chris Free, who is a postdoc at UCSB and who I understand is going to be giving a, a talk uh, at OSU in not not too long from now. He's done some separate work that has looked at climate change impacts and particularly tracking you know where various stocks are likely to um, uh, migrate to under under those kinds of scenarios. Awesome. Thank you so much, Andrew. All right. The next question we have is for Christina. And the question is, with the increase of microplastics in our ocean, what concerns are there for the consumption of those microplastics by humans and associated toxins through seafood? Wow. Uh, <laughs> so, yes, uh, there is a lot of research going on right now looking at trying to understand um, the uh, implications of microplastics on our uh, food resource. Um, and um, so do we fully understand at this particular point in time? Um, not fully, I would say, but a lot of the microplastics that um, are in the ocean um, tend to end up in the parts of the fish that are not consumed. So typically in the gut portion of the, of the fish. And so, um, so that's a positive um, that if we do find them, um, we're not necessarily finding them in the muscle of the fish, which is what we're tending to consume. We're finding them more in uh, the gut as well. But uh, I will also say that this research is really new. We have uh, researchers here at OSU who are, are studying this uh, trying to understand impacts uh, on our food supply, not just our seafood supply, but our, our whole food supply as well. Thank you. That was really insightful. All right, Drew, you're up. All right, question four goes out to Matt and it's asked by Corin Heath. They ask, are there any ongoing research projects associated or, uh, sorry, projects uh, or established operations in Oregon that utilize that IMTA you were talking about? What species combinations have been investigated here? Oh yeah, okay, well, that's a great question. Um, and, you know, I have to think about that a little bit. There isn't uh, much in the way of IMTA uh, being investigated here in Oregon currently that, uh, that I'm aware of, and now there may be more out there that I'm totally aware. I know uh, I, down in Port Orford, they are looking at the um, growing dulse and sea urchins, um, not necessarily in a polyculture system, but, you know, to uh, using dulse as a, a way to fatten sea urchins. Um, uh, so that's one potentially kind of IMTA related thing. I would say um, when I got involved in aquaculture uh, as an undergraduate or uh, yeah, during a research project here in Oregon, uh, I was, uh, one of the things that really that we looked at was the co-culture of salmon, dulse and urchins all in a, a recirculating system. And uh, we actually found that the salmon were, had better condition factors at the end. So they were, their bodies were fatter with respect to their length. Uh, in this case, that's how we measured it. And, um, and then it seemed like it was a pretty effective system. It wasn't the most comprehensive. And we've also looked at uh, the co-culture of um, dulse and sable fish. And there were some kind of promising early preliminary um, outcomes from that, but, it, but not really that comprehensive. So uh, we do have, you know, I don't want to undersell, we have a lot of different types of aquaculture research going on at OSU, um, to, in, oriented around disease and nutrition and genetics. Uh, we just haven't spent quite as much time in the short term looking at IMTA questions. Yeah, thank you, Matt. All right, our next question comes from Laura Anderson and it's to Gil. And the question is, can you elaborate on your statement that ecologically sustain, uh, sustainability certifications can damage or destroy local econo economics, infrastructure, and free markets? Right, so uh, there's been, this has been a major debate for, for the reauthorization of the Magnuson Act. 
was the rebuilding schedule concept. So the rebuilding schedule ideas are based primarily on biological principles of rebuilding. They are not based on economic thinking or seafood, broader seafood systems thinking. And that results in, particularly when you have a long time to rebuild, those communities can't maintain that core process, for example, processing infrastructure. They can't maintain their markets. It's not the destruction of free markets, it's that the, they may lose the markets that they have built to develop it, find that sub, another substitute has come in, and then we have, have to build those markets all over again. And that's not just happened here on the West Coast for some ground fish. It's also happened in the East Coast and other locations. It's other happened in other places of the world. Even a bigger picture, if you think of it globally, is we want to rebuild fisheries in many developing countries that are heavily overfished. What are you going to do over that 10 or 20 year period to rebuild those fisheries and support those communities? So there's a lot of kind of creative thinking about how to get investment in those communities, support them during that time it takes to rebuild, how to get other organizations to invest their long-term, maybe they reap a share of the benefits of returning those fisheries to potential long-term economic levels. But this is a tough challenge. That's how I put it up as a conundrum because there aren't easy answers. And there's still a lot of conversations about how to do this. Thank you, that was a challenging question, but you did great. <laughs> Well, Laura loves to ask me challenging questions. <laughs> All right. Um, question six is going to be aimed at Christina. And the question is, with the increase of microplastics in our ocean, what concerns are there for consumption of those microplastics and those associated toxins through seafood? Um, okay. Um, it's kind of similar to the last question, but... <laughs> but uh, yeah, so uh, as I indicated, uh, microplastics uh, are typically, uh, if they are found in seafood, are typically being found in kind of the intestinal guts of uh, the fish. And that is typically not a uh, food source for humans. And, um, and so um, at this point in time, um, based on the research that we have at, right now, there's not any indications that we should be overly concerned about uh, the impact that microplastics might be having on our food source. But I will reiterate that the, in the research is still in its infancy. Um, and so, um, and so we're, we're learning every day what you know, kind of new implications are with regard to uh, microplastics in the ocean. And so um, what I would say is stay tuned, but right now there should not be something uh, that you should be concerned about, unless you're purposely eating fish guts, I guess, that might be a problem. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Christina. And I'll pass it back to Jenna. Yeah, so our next question is to Matt. We've had actually a couple questions about dulcin microalgae. Um, and so one comes from Amy Hoffman, who is wondering, how and where do we find microalgae to eat? Uh, any tips finding it in a supermarket or grocery stores? Yeah, um, yeah, totally. I, I just like really quickly to follow up on the last question. I just wanted to point out quickly that we're working on, uh, we have a NSF uh, consortium, Pacific Northwest consortium on microplastics. And a couple of key areas there are looking at the impacts of the microplastics on both oysters, especially early oyster larvae, and uh, looking to see if they actually have negative impacts in the on that industry and on the wild animals, as well as an estuarine model. And uh, and then we're building looking at a full risk assessment of um, of how microplastics are going to be impacting you know both fisheries and other uh, socioeconomical. Uh, things of importance. And so that's something to keep an eye on. And if you're interested in that, that we do uh, often do outreach about the Pacific Northwest Consortium on Microplastics. So um, you can reach out to me afterwards. My contact information is probably uh, in, you know, somewhere associated with this. Um, uh, and then so again, coming back to your question about macroalgae, it, it can be a little tricky. So there are some dull startup companies. Um, so Chuck Tumes is actually a, a professor here at OSU. And he is um, also an entrepreneur and has started, uh, I believe it's currently called Dulce, uh, Pacific, um, Oregon Dulce or Pacific Dulce Energy it was formerly. Anyways, they have um, several locations on the 
uh, West Coast here and their uh, distribution as far as where it's going, uh, I, I believe it's mostly going to the restaurants for fresh consumption. Um, but they have looked at, we've worked at the Food Science um, uh, Center in Portland and uh, at potential products that dulse can be used in. And so there was a salad dressing that was available at a uh, Pacific Northwest grocer for a while. Unfortunately, that product's no longer available. Local Ocean Seafoods in Newport was selling dulse on, on weekends on a, as a salad. And with COVID, they have stopped doing that. So it can be challenging. But I, I would say um, if you, when you start next time you're at a grocery store, if you actually do that anymore, <laughs> then I was, you know, um, there are a number of products that you'll start noticing. Uh, there's like spaghetti that I noticed in the Corvallis co-op. Uh, or sorry, uh, it wasn't spaghetti, but it was a type of um, noodle that uh, was infused with kelp. And I mean, it, it actually, once it's kind of on your radar, you'll start seeing all kinds of products that have uh, additions of, of those. And at most co-ops or um, at ours, at least, you can, you can buy a dried product. Uh, a lot of those dried products are wild collected. And I would go out to say they're not quite as good as some of the fresh aquacultured product because they oftentimes sit in the inner tidal a little bit longer and oxidize. Uh, but so I, I'm also biased because, you know, we have a lot of access to fresh dulse in these uh, systems. Uh, but yeah, so that's, I think you'll start seeing it more and more. I know the um, industry claims it's one of the most rapidly demanded um, products out there, but yeah, no straight answer there, but hopefully that gets you pointed in the right direction. Thank you. We'll definitely look for it more in, uh, in stores as it comes out. All right. And our next question goes to Scott. Um, what did management and fishers do to work towards stock recovery in the U.S. West Coast groundfish fishery? And is it really healthy now? Has this caused any problems? Yeah, super complex question. A good one. I think Gil did a good job of alluding to some of the problems, those being that there are uh, economic hardships associated with reduced fishing. And in fact, one of the solutions was to intentionally reduce fishing capacity, that is the number of boats in the water, through that vessel buyback program to get some of the, some of the trawlers uh, out, out of the fishery. And, and, it, and that, that worked to some extent, but it also then of course created a, an additional uh, burden that those remaining, uh, for a while anyway, had to uh, pay back that money as a loan. Although I read something recently that there's a loan forgiveness uh, either moving through Congress or has just moved through Congress on that. I'm not sure what the status is. And so, you know, it was, it was a long and very, you know, seemed like painful process uh, run through the Pacific Fishery Management Council, largely, which is the primary management organization for federal fisheries on the, on the West Coast. And it had to do, they had uh, some, some areas that were closed to fishing. There were gear modifications in place to alter the places that, that, and the types of areas that people were fishing in. And you know, there were size limits, quota changes, those sorts of things, and, uh, and, and a bunch of other actions that were taken and approved through the council. And the council itself, of course, is made up of representatives from the different states and different stakeholders. And so uh, it may or may not be the, the you know, ideal process, but it was a process by which everybody worked together to ultimately come up with these solutions. Uh, obviously, we saw uh, what I would consider to be marked recovery of these populations, uh, many of them recovering as much as decades before predicted, uh, to the point where, at least if you, you know, from an from a ecological side of things, as, as Gil pointed out, the Marine Stewardship Council certification as sustainable is effectively a third party independent certification saying that to the best of our abilities to interpret these data, it seems like it has headed in the right direction. All right, so we have a question for all panelists. And the question is, how has COVID impacted your work? And what do you think the impact of COVID will be for the future of seafood resources? I guess my microphone's unmuted, so I can start in on that one. It has uh, drastically altered, uh, particularly the work that my graduate students are trying to do in some ways. It has kept them out of the laboratories. It has reduced their abilities to get to the coast. And so because of that, their individual work has, has been uh, halted. It hasn't affected me as much 
personally uh, because of the, of the nature of the work that I'm doing now. It seems like I'm doing much more administration of, of other people's research than my own. Uh, but it has certainly seen that. And then the other thing, of course, and I think this is true for everybody, is that it has uh, changed people's sort of anxieties and stress levels regarding their ability to actually get their work done and has created some, some uh, situations for that as well. I, maybe I'll follow up there, if you don't mind. Um, speaking just not so much directly to my research, which of course has been challenging with closures and such, but but more broadly about the seafood and the seafood industry. Um, some of the issues with that is, you know, a large fraction of the seafood we consume are uh, restaurant-oriented seafood. And so the clo restaurant closures and COVID has, has really had negative impacts on kind of the economics and particularly, particularly small producers but across the seafood industry, there's been a lot of um, stress and kind of economic strain on that industry. Uh, so, um, you know, it's something that, that as we move forward out of the, uh, hopefully in the next phases, as we start moving back into some sort of normalcy, we see uh, a rebuilding and recovery. I think part of this discussion of food for the sea is gonna be how do we then, you know, help use food for the sea to, to bring jobs and, and uh, come up with the ways to move forward in a positive manner, but also, you know, how do we help out our, our seafood industry? I would suggest everyone go out and buy some, <laughs> some uh, preferably domestically produced seafood, whether it be wild or aquacultured uh, in your new near future to kind of help those folks out who are struggling. Um, I would just uh, say that I think one thing we've learned from this experience is that uh, human interaction and face-to-face -face discussion is super important for learning and the generation of ideas. And while we can do a lot over Zoom and it's certainly better than, than nothing, I feel like uh, what's really missing from a university experience where I am is all of that kind of energy, excitement and new ideas that get generated when people get together and they do things that are you know partly designed to like focus on the, the question at hand, but you, you know, all of the kind of serendipity that, <laughs> that, that happens through live interaction is missing. And I, I, um, I long for the day when we can get that back. I'll, I'll just chime in real quick. I'm a seagoing oceanographer and we put a lot of instruments in the water to collect data about the environment. Of course, we weren't able to do that researchers, but uh, the fishermen were still fishing. And we have a project led by Francis Chan in our Marine and Resource Management graduate student, Linus Stoltz, where we actually took small sensors for temperature and oxygen and FedExed them to the fishermen. And they were able to get out on their boats, put them in the crab pots. They would record data, come back aboard and have that data come to shore. So I, I actually think one good thing is we realize we have to work together more and continue to work together. I guess I can speak from, from my perspective. Um, I'm at a small unit, uh, so we have lots of space, not a lot of students here. Um, so there was a little bit of juggling of schedules to try to reduce uh, when people are here at the same time. But otherwise, I think our graduate students have been able to proceed with their research. A little bit of delays because of what's happening with processors, um, Matt is right, processors have had to go through a lot of changes. Um, one of the things that is really difficult for industry is constantly changing rules of the game, right? Um, it's very difficult for them to constantly be kind of changing what they do. And, um, and I think another thing that this, uh, this outbreak has, has demonstrated is that it's, it's one thing to try to make changes at a workplace, but there's a broader community that you have to impact as well. And, and so um, I think we have a better appreciation for, um, it's not just one place or one thing that has to change. It's all of us working together that, that have to kind of help and, um, and, and, and help reduce uh, the risk uh, for people. Um, but um, we've still been able to uh, work on uh, projects with uh, uh, innovative companies. Uh, had one working uh, this uh, summer with a company called Blue Wrap, who's 
uh, really kind of innovating along the cold change and trying to figure out new ways to um, uh, change the way that we ship uh, seafood and, and preserve seafood. So uh, still, still exciting things happening here at OSU. All right, thank you everybody for responding. Um, we have another question, and this one's going to go directly to um, Matt. Um, and I shortened it down, it's, by, it's from Trip Nikich. Shorten it down for time, but it says, in aquaculture operations located in river watersheds and other areas, um, agriculture and outdated sewage control along water systems is an ongoing problem. So how can aquaculture function in such an aquatic environment if such pollutants, both biological and chemical, are being regularly included in river, streams, et cetera, flows? Yeah, so that's a great question. I think that's um, that's in general, you know, no, none of these systems are are standalone, and none of them operate in a vacuum. And uh, I work a lot in the marine aquaculture realm, uh, but one of the things that you know that uh, is consistent with kind of what your question is, what you're asking is that um, what we see is you know the how we treat our watersheds, the kind of water quality is important. Those things are going to impact our seafood that are either wild caught or grown in the near shore area. And there's really, um, you know, uh, it should make it give us more holistic thinking to how we treat the environment and how we treat things like pollution um, and regulation and that sort of thing. Now there are, um, you know, aquaculture itself does have uh, nutrient uh, effluents associated with them. So there actually are some opportunities for these agriculture and say fish farms, especially river oriented fish farms to work together where fish farms can actually divert some of their effluents through agricultural lands and help, um, you know, they then fertilize those lands with the, new, the effluents of the fish. And then at the same time that acts as a, a purifier in a way, a biofilter for those, uh, for those water, for that water before re-entering the ecosystem. So there's really some opportunity there for, you know, collaboration between industries. Um, but certainly, yeah, I mean, I, I think um, it's a concern and something to think about. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. All right. Our next question is for Scott and it comes from Walt. And the question is, what additional resources do we need from the, from the state level to take advantage of the opportunity to provide additional food from the sea to feed the world from Oregon? Um, I think I would have to summarize most of the workshop that Gil and others organized to, to really answer that question. It, it's, it is both a management question and an ecology question and a supply chain question. And I think that, that there is support that's needed both at the university for some of the research into that. And then through some of the commodity commissions, potentially the Oregon Salmon Commission, Control Commission and so on and so forth, there are ways to uh, create awareness for Oregon seafood as well that may help. Uh, there's already a, a fair bit of export of Oregon seafood, but there's a lot of uh, other directions that that could go as well. Thank you. Um, all right, and then we have another question, and this one goes to Gil or anyone on the panel from Laurel Kinkle, and it asks, um, can you speak to how, how, to be how best to prepare the workforce needed for these plans for future of seafood to ensure the safety, health, and well-being are all promoted? Yeah, so good question. Um, we've actually been having those discussions with industry uh, we have, for example, internship programs. So industry, seafood is very interested in internship programs. And they are working with Oregon State and some of the other West Coast universities to bring those students into seafood and uh, seafood companies. And some of these internship programs are really cool because you not only do one type of job, but you do many. And in fact, what the companies are doing, of course, they're looking to see who would be future employees for them in their company. There's also ways to partner with our community colleges to do some of this training as well in partnership. Um, and, and I think we could take full advantage of that. I think there's a lot of, a lot of cool ideas where students could actually work on a project for a private company or even do co-op training where they spend a whole year with the company and then come back to finish up their degree. So I think we're just starting to tap the possibilities of this kind of training. We could even do training with um, so senior executives in seafood, bring them back to the university for an intensive training about critical 
uh, skill sets that they might want to, to take on the, the, the newest challenges, whether that be supply chain logistics or adopt, adapting to climate change issues or how to predict that, uh, all kinds of possibilities. And I know we discussed that as a potential at Food for the Sea with some part, other universities. So lots of possibilities here. Yeah, I think that makes some really great opportunities for students to get to learn some of those um, valuable skills. Um, I'll hey, pass Drew. it over to Jenna for another yeah. question. If, ooh, it's fine. Drew, real quick, did, does Christina want to comment on safety? That's kind of up her. Uh, oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Her word. Is there a question specific? Well, go ahead, Drew. You, yeah, I can reiterate. Uh, so it's, can you speak to how to best prepare the workforce needed for these plans for future of seafood to ensure the safety, health, and well-being are all being promoted in that industry? Yeah, so, um, you know, OSU is engaged in uh, a lot of uh, training uh, events that not only do we give them the training to industry professionals, but we also engage our students and uh, having the opportunity to uh, go to these professional workshops as well. Um, so seafood safety is really important. Um, there are uh, uh, certificate programs for uh, uh, food safety and specifically for seafood safety as well that uh, we uh, offer. Uh, just about every graduate student that goes through the OSU seafood lab obtains one of those certificates on seafood safety, learns how to make a seafood safety plan uh, and how to uh, do that. It's required by the processors. The processors have to have trained people in, in, in this particular area. Um, and, um, and, um, and then all the processors have to come up with food safety plans as well. So this is a really important part of all food production, it, um, but it's especially challenging with seafood um, because of the variety of species that are uh, available. Um, you know, when you think about land animals, there's the big three, right? Pork, chicken, and beef. Now try to think about tr applying that uh, to seafood. And they come out of all different types of waters. Um, they come from all different regions of the world. Some species have certain um, susceptibilities that other species do not. Uh, so it's really complicated, um, and but it makes seafood really interesting, I think. Um, and um, and so yeah, that's really important um, safety, and it is something that we're doing here at OSU to help the industry and to to help our students be prepared to go in and um, be able to um, um, make sure that our our industry is able to produce a safe seafood supply. Yeah, thank you so much, Christina. That's a really valuable point about the diversity of different types of, you know, aquaculture foods versus terrestrial. It's really interesting. Right. Um, I'm going to pass it over to Jenna for another question, as long as we got time. Yes. Do we have more time for another question? Yeah, let's, I, I've been watching the questions and there sure are some good ones left. So let's go another um, five minutes and then we'll wrap up. Go ahead, Jenna. All right, sounds good. So kind of jumping off the last question, um, what are some interesting ways in which people are being encouraged in the US, given that uh, there are less, uh, or people in the United States seem to be eating less seafood than, than we uh, could be? What are some interesting ways in which you've seen people be encouraged to embrace seafood, especially those that we don't traditionally think of, like salmon or tuna? And this goes to anyone. Yeah, so, so I'll start that. So one project that actually OSU, the Food Innovation Center, has been involved in is, is the idea of fresh seafood versus frozen seafood. So this word fresh is really weird because what it really means is just unfrozen. Does it mean the fish determine organoleptic or sensory properties is super fresh tasting? It just means it hasn't been frozen. So a lot of work's been done now because we do, we know even for our small local fisheries that work on the Oregon coast, because of the nature of our ocean, they can't go out every day and provide fresh seafood. And a lot of them are trying to do direct marketing. So they're turning to freezing seafood. Now, very high quality, but do consumers accept frozen as high quality? So that's one issue. And, and so I, uh, the Food Innovation Center has been doing a lot of work with consumers 
to look at this question of, of accepting frozen as high quality. And ultimately, logistically, it allows us to actually decrease the price for seafood, provide better ways for storage. So that's just one of many examples. But I'll just tell you, here's, I'll just throw out one other idea. Um, we have a group called, um, that's working on West Coast Groundfish and marketing, per, and marketing um, pos- called Positively Groundfish. And the leader of that group is from Germany. And she said, I don't understand. In Germany, we have baby food for babies at seafood. You know, you have cream peas for babies, right? And all these, we don't have seafood for babies, right? Gerber's seafood baby product. So the question is why, right? Why do they do that in Europe? Why do children start eating seafood paste as a child, but we don't do that here? If we don't get children to enjoy seafood, why are they going to embrace it when they get older? So we have a challenge in this country because the per capita consumption has been flat for 40 years. We are not increasing our consumption. And either we create an excitement over this wild, wonderful world of seafood, right? It's very different than pork or beef. It's a different thing. Um, or are all these complexities and uncertainties and questions people have about seafood going to keep them from consuming it? Uh, so those are big challenges for us. And again, the value of a seafood, a well-designed seafood center take on those challenges. And if you don't mind, this is Matt, I could follow up on that just really quickly. I think what Gil hit on really was really important about um, changing people's, you know, getting into the children's menus. And one, I think, interesting thing I've seen uh, recently because of this, you know, Americans haven't eaten more fish per capita in 20 years, I think. It's, it's pretty much been a flat line. But the, uh, so the NOAA, I believe it's their, uh, the NOAA Federal uh, Aquaculture Office and um, uh, in cooperation with the National Institute of Health have actually worked on this issue. And one of the things they've done is try to develop menus that uh, would encourage, you know, getting youth eating more seafood and, um, and doing things like putting fish on, you know, seafood on sticks and just little things that would make it more interesting and, and looking at it from that perspective and then trying to get it to school menus. So I think you'll hit it really early, right on the head there is that this is a process that really starts early and kind of sets people up for their eating habits for life. And it's, and it's interesting too, because we've created a lot of fear around seafood for uh, pregnant women and, you know, what women eat when they're pregnant influences a lot about what children eat and like later on in their lives. And um, so there's, you know, there's that kind of negative feedback system that's not helping things either. Can, can one of you keep running with this and talk about, um, you know, plants, algae instead of, instead of the meat? That also came up in, uh, say, Andrew's discussion of people substituting seafood for one form or another. How do we eat more plant-based food from the sea? It's, a, it's the same idea. And I always think of how do we get the children, but also the role of chefs, right? We seem to be very, very attuned to what chefs are doing. And when we've worked with, Matt, as you may have seen, when we worked with uh, Dulce, the thing that stunned me was how excited chefs were to get this product in their hands and what they could do with it. So um, how to engage both ends, it's like both ends. We have to get Children engage. We have to get chefs that end of the seafood chain engaged to and start changing people's culture and experience with seafood. I'm not saying it's easy. I don't think it is easy. I think it's really challenging. But I think there's a lot of cool ideas out there. If we keep saying it's just too complicated, see, no one knows seafood. We can't. Then you really come. Well, we can't do anything about it. And that's where the seafood industry has been for 20, 30 years. They've kind of run into these same roadblocks, the same excuses. We see them all the time in my 35 years in the business uh, without really being able to make breaking through those barriers. I'm hoping we can start breaking through those. Yeah, I, I, I will say that for, for the macroalgae, you know, one of the big challenges right now, we are, uh, people are meeting and trying to discuss and understand who regulates macroalgae. Is this a USDA regulated project product? Is this an FDA regulated product? What is, what is, how do we create food safety around the macroalgae? And um, those are discussions that are happening right now. Like we're, we're, we're still trying to figure that out. Um, and, and that's one of the barriers that we have, right? Uh, to production. It's, it, if you don't have any clarity around the regulations, 
with regard to how things are produced and how we can market them, then, that, then there, there's always this, in, you know, impossible barrier that to go over. And there's, you know, people right now working, trying to reduce those barriers and, um, and, and enable uh, entrepreneurs. And so most of the people getting into algae production are small businessmen, right? And so they can't really afford these really large barriers to uh, them getting into the business. And so one of the things that we can help do, and especially a, a center could do is, is help, you know, lead some of those discussions and also help, help provide clarity for the, for the industry. So, so just, I just wanted to add a comment here, particularly given Christina, when a lot of our foods were developed, we didn't have reg regulatory agencies, right, controlling the production of agriculture. Unfortunately for seafood development, we have a lot of regulatory agencies now, and she's exactly right. If we can't work, and one role that OSU can play is to be that trusted nexus to work with the agencies and the industry to find the creative ways to address these these regulations or otherwise they remain barriers and they're going to they get in the way of advancing the fishing and seafood industry and Christine is a great example of someone who's a trusted nexus in trying to address those issues uh, it's a real potential that role that OSU can play in this space can I just uh, mention that the the other thing on the horizon then I don't know if people are familiar with this but there's a lot of venture capital money going into cell-based seafood now. So the idea is basically you produce this stuff in the lab. It looks like a salmon steak uh, or tuna steak. And the idea behind it, um, which uh, I've been part of a group that's gotten money to look into it, the idea was, well, you know, could you take pressure off of wild stocks by producing, you know, by essentially changing uh, demand, right, by having this alternative substitute. Uh, I think there's a lot of steps in that process to go from cell-based seafood to wild stocks being better off, but uh, it's just something that there's a lot, there is a lot of interest in and uh, a lot of money going into. I have one last comment about the seaweed, if that's all right. Um, I think one of the challenges there is uh, that these things just take time, right? So there's a lot of excitement about uh, seaweed culture and, and people come to me and say, well, where do I get it? Well, you know, we need to, it takes time to establish producers to grow it. And then they say, well, where's the demand? <laughs> you know, so, so there are a lot of startups happening now. And I think there's a lot of excitement around macroalgae. And we see a ton of products when you go in using, you know, small fractions of it. But I think that next step is just going to take a little bit of time before the demand and the supply kind of, they have to kind of organically grow together and that there's just a lag time there. And I think we're a bit in that lag. I know genetic improvement map. So that dulse does indeed taste like bacon. <laughs> <laughs> right. I think, uh, Drew, with your and Jenna's permission, I'd like to try to wrap up. I really want to thank the two of you for leading us in a lively Q&A session. And I think that last question really was great, engaged all of us. And boy, Christina, I'd love to be called a, a trusted nexus. So I think that was a great, great line there. So uh, with all the questions, I want to say that we will answer those. We'll pass them around the various experts here and uh, Virginia is going to help us get those back to the folks that asked them. So really appreciate them. We won't leave them dangling. We'll get back to you. Uh, good night, everybody. <laughs>